Well, hey, praise God. Um, how are we doing this morning? Good? Okay. Hey, I want to say, um, who was here last week and who heard the message from Corey last week? Um, th- there was one thing that he said that was like, like really, really amazingly awesome. The rest of it was okay. But the one thing um, that he said was, he said that if, if you feel like you keep on going through the same trial over and over again, that's because God loves you so much that he wants you to get something in that season. Isn't that cool? So just be encouraged that if you feel like you keep on tripping over the same thing, um, well, be encouraged and also get wisdom, okay? Because God wants to give you <laughs> something in that season. So that, I thought it was really cool, and we were blessed um, by that message. Um, so we are continuing uh, in our sermon series called Joy Story. Um, we're going through the book of Philippians, and I will be talking about humility. Yeah. You can get it, get the laughs out. Go ahead. Go. Um, I got to say that I've really been working on it. I'm really proud of my humility now. I've really been striving to become humble. And I'm not going to say that I arrived, but I'm 93% there. So just learn from me today in my humility. Just gather and just learn from me. Okay, like Paul said, be as I am. You know, I'm not going to say I'm Paul, but you can call me Paul for this message. No, I'm, I'm done now. It is funny that I'm uh, going to be preaching on humility, but we are going to be cracking into Philippians 2, chapter 2, and we're going to be talking about the humility of Jesus, which is true humility. A lot of false stuff out there, but there's the true stuff, and it's the Jesus stuff. Um, so I have like kind of four parts today. I have this gnarly introduction, which could be a message in and of itself, and so I'm going to really try to get through some of that, but I got an intro that's an intro all its own, okay? And then I want to talk about false humility, which is really just me ranting, that's just going to be a rant, so get ready for that. If you're going to put something on YouTube, get your phones out. That's what you want to grab. Um, and then we're going to talk about true humility, which is really just the life of Jesus. Jesus, it's not like an attribute of him. He is humility. He is humbleness, period. And then we're going to talk about how we can get into a position to humble ourselves. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I will read the, the verse. We're going to read 5 through 11 of um, chapter 2 of Philippians. I'm going to take that one little snippet. I had a lot more of an assignment, but I'm just going to take that one piece. I feel like that's the piece that God um, wants to um, speak to us this morning. So I'll go ahead and read it, and then we'll get in to this, um, this deal. Paul to the Philippians saying, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Isn't that cool? Jesus. So that at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, you, you gave us more than words to think about. You gave us a life to, to live by. You gave us an example. And Lord, you've called us into that life. You've called us to walk in the steps that you left for us. You've called us to be like you. And so, Lord, we just want to learn from your spirit and we want to learn how it is that we can enter into this place. If Paul says that we can have something, then we can have it and we want it. And so, Lord, we come to you now humbly. We, we humble ourselves to receive from you, knowing that we need from you. And we ask you to inspire us and we ask you to encourage us and we ask you to give us this conviction that leads us into what you have. So, Lord, that's what we want. Nothing small, only big things, Lord. We're here, and we're gathered in your name, and we want to be more like you. So we just love you. We thank you. The humble one, Jesus. Amen. 
So Paul says, he starts out and he says, have this mind among yourselves, which when someone says, hey, have this mind among yourselves, you would think they're going to tell you a way to think, or you would think they're going to give you some words that someone taught. But what's interesting about how Paul starts out is he says, have this mind among yourselves, and then he goes on to describe the way that Jesus lived. That's because in Christ, we have more than just a teacher. We have a life lived to follow. Amen? Jesus did not come into the world to give us a demonstration of the impossible. He came into our world to give us a new mindset and to give us a new pattern and a new way of life. The book of Hebrews wrestles with this really hard concept of the God-man, Jesus. And it says in Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Then the book of Hebrews goes on to say, here's how you live that life. This means that Jesus is completely relatable. Amen? Jesus did not come into the world to do things that only God could do. He came to demonstrate what mankind was created to do. And he invites us into that. And so when Paul says, have this, Jesus says, have this. John 14, 12, this is what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, I say to me, I say to us, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Jesus didn't come to show off with his life. Jesus showed up with our life. He's more than a teacher. He's a demonstrator. He's more than just words to live by. He's actions to imitate. He said that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's our way. He's our truth in our life. Amen? We have a guy in our small group who we were going around. We have, we have a men's small group that meets on Tuesdays. And we were going around the circle. And um, Steve, our leader, who always asks really tough questions because he's just difficult. We love him, though. You know. Um, he said, hey, he says, he says hey, um, like, really, like, what do you want people to remember you for if you died today? Which is like, come on, man. I'm, you know, we're just trying to eat snacks. You know what I mean? So he's like, but if you died today, what would you want people to remember you for? And there was a guy in our group. You know, he had that one person who said something that you wish you said. And you can't say it after him because that means you're just copying. He said, you know what I want? He said, this is what I want. I want my words and I want my actions to be the same. I want what I say and what I think to actually be who I am. And in Jesus, we not only have a teacher, but we have a demonstrator. We have someone who said humility, someone who lived humility. Someone who said life, someone who lived life. Someone who said love, someone who lived love. And so when Paul says, have this mind, he's not just talking about think these thoughts. Because a mindset is totally different. It's more than just thoughts. That's on the next page that I get to that. Okay, hold on. I, I, I'm really tight with my notes today. Like two weeks ago, I preached with no notes, and now I feel like I can't even get away from them. So anyway, so here's what a mindset, let me just define a mindset real quick. A mindset is more than just mere thoughts. A mindset is a thought life that is animated by conviction, okay? A mindset is a deeply held set of beliefs that drive the will. It's a motivator. And our mindset, our mindset will turn our thoughts into actions. And so when Paul says have this mind, he's not talking about thinking, he's talking about put on a mindset that's going to move you to be. Be like Jesus. And we can be like Jesus because Paul invites us into it and Jesus invites us into it. We can actually be like him. 
That's the encouragement on the front end. Thus concludes the introduction. I got more, but I'm going to keep going. Okay, it's time for the rant. You ready? I'm telling you, get this one. Nothing I'm going to say is in the Bible. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I like when you said that the last week. You're like, hey, I don't know if this is the Lord, but let me tell you something. It was the Lord, man. It, yeah, it's like a caveat, you know. <laughs> you don't get out like that. You're preaching, you know what I mean? So anyway, so, I, you know, I become a Christian. I, I'm 24 years old. I become a Christian, and, and I really, really grabbed a hold of the idea that Jesus can actually save me, right? How many of you know that Jesus can actually save you? Yeah. And so I grabbed a hold of this, and so I kind of gave my life to the Lord. I had what, you know, evangelicals call a born-again experience, right? And then I'm like, yes, I'm saved. I am saved. I know that if I die today, Steve, I know that if I die today, I will be with my Heavenly Father and Jesus forever. And I was convinced of that, and I was really, really strong in that, and I was really, really true to that. And then I started meeting people. And I'm like, man, you know that you can like know that you're going to be saved, and you can know that you're in Christ. And I, I'd meet certain people, and they'd be like, whoa, young man, humble down. You can't know that you're saved. That's presumptuous. You know, and the Bible says to be humble, and so I really, really struggled, because I really did. These people that were telling me this, I loved, and they said, you can't know that you're saved. And I'm like, man, I'm really struggling with that, because I really feel like I am. And so here's, here's, here's what my first, the first two years of my salvation looked like this. I only listened to AM Christian radio. And I was a salesperson, okay? So I'd drive around to different appointments and stuff. And every time, like, one of the preachers would give an altar call, I'm pulling over. And I'm giving my life to the Lord again. Because who knows if I sinned that day? Who knows if I had a Christ consciousness that day? I was not sure of my salvation. But let me tell you, through much pain and much prayer and much convincing by the Holy Spirit, I became assured of my salvation. Much to the chagrin of many people who were falsely humble. So, sure of my salvation, I move on. I start moving into my career. I start moving into business. Lo and behold, I was pretty good at a couple things. And people kept on promoting me. People in my job kept promoting me, kept giving me more money, kept giving me more responsibility. And I was like, yeah, this is good. But then I started to feel bad because that's not humble. And I would meet people who would say things like, Tony, you got to be careful because, yeah, you're good at what you do, but you got to be careful because it can take you over. And you got to keep humble, man. You got to be careful when you grow in your career. And I just wanted to do a good job. And I can honestly say that I didn't really even care about the money. I just wanted to be excellent. And I just wanted to win in the market, you know? And so I had to fight through this idea that. In the world, the way that God built me, where he put me in space and time, and the way that he gifted me is I have to have power. I have to have authority where I am. That's how God made me to be, and it was really difficult, really hard. And there were times, my wife will tell you, there were times where I just wanted to grow a beard, get weird, move to the mountain, and pray. <laughs> nah, I just shaved this morning. I cut myself up really bad, but... But like, like I, I, I had success in life, and I struggled with success in life. I struggled with the talents and the gifts and the callings that God gave me. And I struggled with the opinions that he gave me and the way that I was able to move. And, and there were people that were telling me that that could really ruin me. And so I was really, really struggling. And then finally, this was just in the last couple of years, I realized serving the church and, and just kind of being around people that I'm rather opinionated. Um, that, I, that I really, when I grab a hold of a truth and I know it's from the Lord, I will not let it go. And if you don't have the truth, I'm going to give it to you. And, you know, I, I just became like really convinced of things and I became really persuasive in things and I began to grow in just the Lord and began to grow in my convictions in the Lord and I saw that some people were getting free and some people were leaving the church, but it's okay, you know, because... I knew that God called me for purposes and called me for great things, and so I began to pursue that. But over time, I began, to, I began to really, really have this thought in the back of my head that got to the front of my head, and that thought was, God really doesn't like me. God doesn't like my boldness. God doesn't like how I'm going about my life because it's not humble. 
And then finally, some months ago, we, we gathered a group of prophets together. And one of them particularly spoke a word over me. And they basically just read my mail and they said, Tony, you're afraid that God doesn't like you. That God doesn't like your boldness. That God doesn't like your loud mouth. You're afraid of all that. But God built you that way for a purpose. And you are trustworthy. And you are in his hands and you're good. And I'm convinced today that that's true. Despite my own ability to be falsely humble and despite other people's attempts to humble me. I'm untouchable now, baby. No. <laughs> He's a monster. No. But there is a, <laughs> but there is a false humility, though. There, there is a false humility. And, and really, like, the Lord's been like, okay, so then that's not humble. So what is humble? Of course, humble. Now we're moving to the part that's biblical. Um, humble is the life of Jesus, of course. And so we see in Philippians 2 that we just read, it says, have this mind among yourselves, right? Because we don't stand alone. We stand in Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. But emptied himself. Emptied himself of what? It's an important question to understand what humility is. If we're invited into the mindset of Christ who humbled himself, we have to understand what he emptied himself of if we want to be like him, right? Are we convinced that we should be like Christ, that we're called to be like Christ, that we have the power to be like Christ? Then let's understand what he emptied himself of. But before I tell you that, I want to tell you what he didn't empty himself of. He didn't empty himself of power. Amen? Jesus was powerful. He was known for being powerful, actually. He was well known for being powerful. In uh, John uh, chapter 3, verse 2, we see a, a teacher, a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus, going to Jesus by night. And this is what he says to Jesus. Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus was a miracle worker. Jesus showed signs and wonders. Jesus healed. Jesus rose people from the dead. And people recognized his power. People sought after him, no matter what it would cost them even. Nicodemus could have been in a lot of trouble for being caught. That's why he went at night. But even the, the people in power yielded to the power of Jesus. Jesus did not empty out his power as a humble servant. Jesus was full of power. Not only in his dealings with humanity and the brokenness of humanity, but he was also powerful when it came to Mother Nature. He rebuked Mother Nature. <laughs> the creation. Creation. Not Mother Nature. Mother Nature is a pagan god. Sorry. <laughs> Mother Gaia. No, I'm just kidding. Matthew. I'm going back to my notes now. Matthew 8, 27. They're in the boat, the boat, the waves and stuff, and like they're dying and they're really freaking out. They finally wake Jesus up. Jesus gets up rather annoyed, rebukes the sea and rebukes the waves and says, you have little faith. And they look at him and his disciples say, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Powerful. We have to understand that when Jesus emptied out his godhood and took on manhood, he didn't empty himself of power. So it cannot be the case that being humble is living a powerless life. Amen? Here's another thing that he didn't empty out. His opinions. Thank God. He was opinionated, man. You know, I, I, really, there's a lot of things you could say about his opinions, and he was insistent on his opinions. But I love it in uh, John chapter 4 where he goes and talks to the Samaritan woman at the well. You have to understand that for really centuries, the Samaritans and the Jews were in an argument of who God really was, who is the real God, who is the true God. Jesus shows up, loves her, loves her, speaks to her, ministers to her, but they get in this little debate. And in John 4.22, Jesus just finally tells her his opinion. He says, look, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. 
That's an opinion. You think you know God, you don't know God. We got God. You don't have God. We have God. You don't have God. You get that? Opinions. He had a lot of opinions. He had opinions about how to take care of the temple sacrifices. He had opinions about how to take care of the poor. He had opinions about everything. He always was giving, leveraging his opinions to people. He didn't shy away from an opinion. So we know this. We know that being humble doesn't mean you're powerless, doesn't mean you're without opinion. I hold on to the opinion one, man. Like, yes, I do, you know. Pray for me, Josh, during this thing. Okay. So the third thing, he didn't pour out his influence. He was influential. We see over and over and over again that all the crowds, all the regions, I love the way the message puts it in Matthew 4.25. It says, large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, I don't know if, what that is. Um, Jerusalem, the ten towns though, seriously. Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from east of the Jordan to the river, People were trying to get at this man. He had influence. His influence grew even to the ten towns, folks. He was a big deal. So, it says here, it says, He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, but he was powerful, didn't empty himself of power, didn't empty himself of opinions, didn't empty himself of influence, didn't empty himself of controversy. Controversy. He was controversial. He used that power. He used that influence. He used that authority. He used his opinions to create controversy. Why are Christians afraid to be controversial? Jesus was not. John 8, 58 through 59, he kept saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. All these I am statements. And he brought them right to the edge. And people asked him, really, who are you? And he told them, he said, look, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Making himself equal with God, making himself one with the Father. And so they picked up stones to throw at him. (laughs) But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. You ever had someone pick up a stone in their mind and throw it at you? It doesn't feel good, but sometimes it's necessary. Jesus was powerful. Jesus was influential. Jesus was opinionated. Jesus was controversial. What did he pour out? What did he pour out? Why is humility pouring out? And what is pouring out? I'll tell you on the next page. The true humility of Jesus is seen in the way he used his power. That's number one, in the way. And number two is in where he got his power from. The humility of Jesus is demonstrated in the way he used his power. There was one point in his earthly ministry where he walked into a synagogue and all eyes were on him. This man of influence, this man of power, this man of esteem, all eyes were on him. And he walked into the synagogue and he was going to teach from the Torah, from the law. And he picks up a scroll from Isaiah. And he's going to tell us what all that power and influence and authority is all about and why he brought it. He's going to tell us what that power is for right here. He says this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Drop the mic. (laughs) Jesus says that his power, influence, authority is for a purpose. What purpose? The purpose is to bring good news to the poor. The purpose is to set the captives free. The purpose is to bring sight to the blind and to break off chains of the oppressed. And this is humility. Humility is not a life absent of power. It's a life of power in service to the powerless. Let me say it again. Humility is not a life absent of power, but it's a life of power in service to the powerless. Amen? 
There's some examples of how he did this, how he lived this powerful life for the powerless. There's one, um, the story of the woman who's caught in adultery. You know that story in uh, John? Some people say it shouldn't be in the Bible, but we don't listen to those people. There's a story um, in the book of John about this woman who's caught in adultery. She was actually set up, and it was just the woman. The man wasn't there. Last time I checked, it takes two to tango. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> he had influence, right? So what did he use it for? So they brought this woman to him and they said, woman, teacher, they tried to trap him. They said, teacher, this woman's caught in adultery. And how did he use his authority? How did he use his power? He used his power to bring truth, to free her between a rock and a hard place. He said, let he who has not sinned cast the first stone. He used his influence. He used his intellect. He used his power with the word to free her. And she was not killed. At the end of it, she said, go and sin no more. He said, go and sin no more. He helped a powerless victim in a moment with his power, and then he empowered her to go and live a sinless life, a life without that sin. You know, Jesus had influence with the, with the Heavenly Father too, right? He had influence with the Heavenly Father. How did he use his influence for us? Pretty clear. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he, that's God, he, God the Father, made him Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus had righteousness and he had influence. And he leveraged that for you and me, powerless sinners. Amen? The humility of Jesus was in the way he used his power, his authority, and his influence. And that's what we're invited into. I think the application is pretty clear. Some of you have a, um, a drive for excellence. Noel Berkey. You have a drive for excellence. You do. You have, you have a, a, in your mind, you have what excellence looks like, and you go for it. Go for it. Be great. But be great in service to those around you. Some of you have resources. Some of you are wealthy. Some of you are good at business. Not a lot in this room, but some people out there are really good. God is good with that, man. God is good because you know what? Resources is influence is power, right? You have power through your resources. And the question is not resources, yes or no. The question is, what do I do with my resources? Some of you have beauty. For the sake of posterity, I won't say anything else. But some of you have beauty. Some of you are really, really like, not only do you, do you emanate beauty, but you also create beautiful things. You're, you're artists and you're capable and you have a, you have a, a sense of what is honoring to God in, in the physical realm and that's awesome. Unfortunately, many people in Christianity will say that's worthless, wrong. We're supposed to create beautiful things. And you have that ability with art and with your talent. And God says, go for it. Be beautiful. Create beautiful. But don't remove yourself from the ugly. (laughs) Create beauty for all. Some of you have a family lineage. Some of you have a lineage. You have a family that is solid, stable. You have many generations in a row where your family stayed together and you have this beautiful bloodline that you are, you are um, just tapping into and you have all these um, resources and you have all these benefits and all these advantages from your family line. That's not cause for you to separate from the rest of the broken families. It's cause for you to emulate for those families to become reconciled to God as well. You have strategies for communicating and you have understandings in the family dynamic that the people out there need and you can share those things. Because having those things doesn't separate you from brokenness. Brokenness, Having those things uniquely qualifies you to fix brokenness. Amen? You know, and I can talk about gifts and talents and some of you have education. Lots and lots of education. Many titles and degrees and things behind your name. 
You know, education is the, one, of the, one of the fastest, most powerful ways to grow and influence and to grow financially. But what are we using that education for? That's the difference between being humble and not being humble. Jesus did not pour himself free of, out of power, influence. He walked in it to serve the powerless. That's the call. Be great, be good, be beautiful, be powerful, be wealthy, and serve. That's the call. That's humility. You can even be opinionated and loud. Just serve. Use it for truth. There's a second aspect of Jesus' humility. The first aspect, of course, is that he used his power for the powerless. The second one is where he got his strength from. And we see in John uh, chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. He chose to lay down his own strength, his own self-will, so he could depend solely on the Father. Amen. That's why it says at the end of our scripture that we just read that therefore God has exalted him and has bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And every knee will bow because Jesus bowed the knee to the Father. I think for many of us, we've come to terms with the first part, right? Like we're okay with being powerful or we're okay with being influential or we're okay with being beautiful or we're okay with having talent to create beauty or, you know, we're okay with our education and we're okay with the pursuits that make us influential, great people. But we struggle in the second category to yield those things to the will of the Father. Amen? So, where we are in our humility walk is maybe we are in a place where we should take those things that God has given us and we should give them to God and say, what do you want to do with them? Amen? How do you want to use me? Then once we get past that hurdle of finally giving that over to the Father and trusting him with that, then he gives us something. That's scary. <laughs> you know, like I love Steve's prayer. He prayed that we'd have lots of kids. Well, how we doing? <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you parents have realized that you can pray for kids, but when, you, but when you're given the kids, you need, you need God to raise them? Amen? Or they ain't going to see their third birthday, just being, just being honest. When we submit our power and our life and our authority, and we, we submit the rule of our life to the rule of God, we'll notice something real quick. He'll step in and he'll give us a calling. He'll give us a burden. You know, we got people here that are going out. They have burdens for, for different places in the world. How many of you know that when you bring your power to God and say, what do you want from me? He gives you a calling that you cannot do alone. You can't do it. That's why Jesus, he clung to, he emptied himself of self-will. He emptied himself of his own strength. And he went to the Father and said, I can't do the thing you call me to do unless you're with me. And that's what he modeled for us. And he didn't need to do that, but he did it because he wanted us to get it. In our lives, we have people that have been put in our path to love. We have been given churches that we are called to build. We've been given businesses that we are called to build. We've been given children that we are called to raise. We've been given uh, lots of things, burdens. We've been given cities, countries. We've been given diseases that we're called to eradicate. Um, we've been given prayers that will break our heart. Because these things are given by the Father. And humility says, yes, to the thing given. And humility says, only by your strength, Father, can I do it. And that's how Jesus was. He wielded his power for the powerless, and he did it in the name of the Father, and he did it in the power of the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that's true humility. And we're called to that because we can have this mindset. Isn't that cool? Moving to part four. 
which is he humbled himself. I think one of the things that is um, really important for us in our relationship, you know, we have a relationship with the Father, which is crazy that the all-powerful God who created the heavens and the earth actually just wants to relate to us. Isn't that crazy? I, I really, I was praying on that this morning. I'm like, Lord, I wouldn't even hang out with me for five minutes. But he really does. He, he really likes us, and he really wants to relate to us. And I think one of the things that's really important to realize about our relationship with the Father um, through Christ is that there are things that he does in our relationship, and there are things that we do in our relationship, right? That's really important for married people to understand. There's like things that, you, that your spouse does and things that you do. Like if it's your thing to do the laundry, do the laundry because that's your thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's really any relationship, it's true that there are things that they do and there are things that you do. And I think one of the things, one of the prayers that I've heard um, prayed, and I'm not trying to be um, too saucy or too, too bold right now, but one of the, one of the prayers that I, that I hear prayed a lot that I, that I cringe a little bit is the ones where we ask God to humble us. You know what I mean? Like, Lord, humble me. I was praying. This is three years ago. I was praying. I was in some sin, and I was in some things that were really difficult. And I was, I was with someone who, thankfully, is my mentor and seasoned in the Spirit. And I'm kneeling, and I'm crying. And I'm like, Lord, just humble me. And then this guy, he jumps in. He's like, no, don't do that. No, no, no. He's good. He's all right. <laughs> and the, what he was doing was, is he was empowering me through the Spirit to give my life to him, to, to God. I want to explain this a little bit further because I think I lost some people. We have to invite God into some things in our life. There are things that we have to invite God into for him to move in. What you'll see in the scripture, and if you look at it here again in uh, Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He was the actor. He was the first cause of being poured out. He emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. God has given you a will. God has given me a will. Amen? You ever used your will for anything outside of God? Yeah. <laughs> Don't confuse the circumstances of self-will with God humbling you. We're called to humble ourselves because we have authority, we have power, we have a will that God gave us, and when we choose to yield our will, he moves in our life. It's not purely like that. I feel like I'm Corey. Like, like, it's not purely that way. There's lots of scripture around other things that can happen, but really, fundamentally, though, Jesus humbled himself, amen? And we're called to humble ourselves. Let's get some more scripture around that because I feel like I'm hanging out there. Let's go. Uh, James 4.10. James, good guy, apostle, wrote scripture. Do we agree? All right. James 4.10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5.6. Peter was man of the spirit. Humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. See, we humble ourselves. We yield our strength. We yield our will to the Father, and then he exalts us in him for his glory. Amen? Okay. I'm going to invite the band back up because definitely at the end of my message. But um, what we're going to do with this last, kind of, this last moments of the service is what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to do something first, and we're going to invite God into that. Is we're going to if you want to, you know, no one can make you. God, God won't even make you, but um, we're going to get into a posture of humbling ourselves, if you want. And I'm going to pray us into that, and then you can just follow how you see it in your spirit. But just know this, though. Be encouraged in this, is that God wants us to be powerful. God wants us to be influential. God wants us to have wealth. How many of you know that if you don't have power, influence, resources, you can't serve those who are broke and poor, Right? God wants us to have that. It's good things that we pursue. But he wants us to yield that to him and his power, his authority. And he wants us to serve those who don't have. That's, that's the way. That's the way of humility. Let's rise and let's um, pray.
Let's ask God to move again in our hearts. Lord, first of all, I pray that, that the words that we, that we heard are not just thoughts, but they're a mindset. Lord, that, 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 that we would add our, to our thoughts conviction and that we would add to our thoughts the ability, the motivation, the determination to pursue the life of Christ. And Lord, with that, Lord, we choose to look to Jesus as our model. We choose to look to Jesus as the one that we want to be like. Amen, folks? We choose to look at how Jesus walked out his life, and we choose to walk in those footsteps. We choose to say, Lord, have your way in us, Lord. We choose to look at the way of Christ, and we choose to pursue. And we can have that because we're invited into it. And the first part of the prayer is just a prayer of thanksgiving. And I want to thank God for all the gifts and all the talents and all the callings and all the burdens and all the greatness that's in this room. I want to thank God for that. And just be with me in that, okay? Lord, we just thank you that you've blessed us. Lord, we thank you that you've given us strength, that you've given us wealth, that you've given us wisdom, that you've given us gifts and callings, that you've given us talents, that you've given us purposes and plans. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us, Lord, and we receive the fullness of that. Lord, we are rich in you, and we recognize it. We are powerful in you. And Lord, we rebuke any false humility. We rebuke any false humility that would say that you don't want us to be powerful that you don't want us to be influential, that you don't want us to have authority, that you don't want us to have godly opinions, Lord. We rebuke all that, and we receive the fullness of all the power that you want to bestow on us. And we ask the floodgates to open up, Lord, and for you just to bless, double bless, and all the other things that we say, Lord. We just ask that you would just pour out your blessings and pour out all the goodness that you have for us, Lord, because we want it. All the children and all the legacy and all the, the new legacy that you're building, Lord, all the plans, purposes, callings, Lord, everything that's in our hearts to do and be that is of you, Lord, we ask you to pour out. And we receive it, Lord. And Lord, I pray again for any, any brokenness in that understanding that you want us to be great and powerful in the world, Lord. I pray for that to be broken off, Lord, for your glory. And Lord, with those things that you've given us, Lord, those great, beautiful things, we choose in our humility, we choose to lay those at your feet. We choose to realign our will with yours. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, and we say, Lord, make something great of all this greatness that you've given us. And Lord, we realign ourselves again with your will, with your purposes. Lord, we pray for a tuning of your will in our lives. We pray for a course correction. We invite you, Lord, to search us and know us, and we invite you to prune. We lay down our will and we say, not our will, but your will be done. Just like Jesus did, Lord. We can do nothing. If you've given it to us, we can't have it without you. Amen? If you've given it to us, we can't have it without you. You've given us callings and purposes and desires. You've given us relationships. You've given us people to love. And Lord, you've given it to us, and we need your power to fulfill. And so, Lord, we lay down our own self-will, our own selfishness in it, Lord, and we ask you to empower those things you've given us for your glory. And we get our hands off it and we watch you take it right now for our joy and for your glory. Amen.